presentation. Thank you. This is going to talk about measuring pressure ulcer rates and how to evaluate your prevention practices. Joining us for this presentation. I'm Karen Volkowski, and I'm an associate professor at Montana State University. Executive editor for the Journal of the World Council of Interosomal Therapists, and editor for the International Ostomy Guidelines. If you heard of the WCET, we're an international organization of about 60 countries, and we do wound ostomy incontinence. I'm a board member for the Journal of Management and Advances in Skin and Wound Care. I serve as a legal consultant for medical chart news, suits involving hospitals and nursing homes, and a former National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel member. I'm going to talk about why you want to look at prevalence and incidence and how you calculate these rates. We're going to look at facility practice and how you can evaluate it. And why, if a patient develops a pressure ulcer, it's actually a learning opportunity. Even we think of pressure ulcers as being very negative consequences, certainly are distressing, but they have a very good opportunity for staff education. Please make a note of any questions you have and refer these to your quality improvement specialist to follow up with. Maintenance of pressure ulcers and incidents of pressure ulcers tell where your practice can be improved. Look at your aims, improve, and sustain these improvements know where you are, how do you know if you're getting better or if you're backsliding? And these are really important considerations when you're talking about pressure ulcer care. It's easy to go from one initiative to another and stop doing what you originally were doing that were making practice better. Overall pressure ulcer rates actually stopped going down and in 2014, started going back up. This is from Hillrom, who conducts a very large survey of facilities across the world, and especially in the United States. And so track overall prevalence, and so incidence, which is also called facility acquired. You can see in 2013, Overall prevalence was 10%, and it was up to 10.2 in 2014. Now, that might not sound like a significant amount, but seeing that the trend is not going down further, actually started back up, is a problem. And worrisome is the fact that the facility acquired or ulcers that your patients developed after they came to your facility went from 0.7 to 3.9 after decreasing significantly from 2007. Here, you see the trend from 9.5 to 9.7, 3.7 to 3.8. These aren't large, but then it's showing improvement. It's going the wrong direction. One of the dramatic increases was in term care, where overall prevalence went from 10.6 to 12%. They acquired from 4.7 to 6.4. This is really quite problematic. We know people are living longer. We know you're seeing more acute patients from acute care to nursing home. In the case of pressure ulcers, actually, Half of the patients with a pressure ulcer go to a nursing home, and that's three times more than any other condition. But it can also give us some indication of the problems of transitions of care and what's going on between facilities. From acute care, 
went from 25 to 25.2. Facility acquired incidents went from 3.8 to 5.5, and that's a pretty big jump. It's the only place that showed an infant prevalence, and that just simply means that people are coming into there with more pressure ulcers. The facility acquired rate actually went down to 2.88. So this is really important to note. Talking about the outcomes, I'm talking about prevalence, which is people in your facility today that are sure also. And we calculate both rates based on each unit and then pull them for looking at a rate for your overall facility. The events can also be called facility acquired or hospital acquired. And what it means is the people that developed a pressure ulcer after they were admitted to your facility. And this is really the important piece. If you're having a lot of people coming in with a pressure ulcer, it's a little bit different than if the people are developing them while they're in your care. Have a very high prevalence rate, such a high acuity patient. You're a lot of people coming in that already have a pressure ulcer. And what you need to consider with this, and it's always an argument between nursing home and the hospital. The hospital says we sent the patient to the nursing home and they did not have a, a pressure ulcer. You sent them back now and they do. Well, the reason is the person's going downhill, and if they were well, they wouldn't be coming back to the hospital. The end, the, the nursing home says, we said, take this patient, and when we got the patient, we found they had a pressure ulcer you didn't tell us about. So the communication between levels of care, both within your facility and as patients transfer to another level of care outside your facility, is cool in understanding what the needs are of your patient and really dealing with some of these high acuity patients. Second reason you might have a high prevalence is because such a good job of caring for pressure ulcers or wounds in general. In other words, we've had a number of nursing homes where their prevalence rate went way up. They were getting patients with wounds because they did such a good job and physicians were asking for their patient to go there. Prevalence alone isn't saying anything about your care, it's saying something about the acuity of your patients. Start into an initiative and you're actually tracking these and you learn more about what a pressure ulcer and how to identify them. You also see that your prevalence and incidence rates go up temporarily. Down this is part of the New Jersey Hospital Association Pressure Ulcer Collaborative. Were better able to recognize what they were and were accurately gauging them and identifying them, and therefore the rates went up before we saw a dramatic decrease in health prevalence and incidence. Now, we also rate we all stages. Calculate how many stage one, stage two, stage three. Most facilities. So when you're doing a prevalence or incident study, don't look at stage two and above. It is not only information from the medical records, but also actually going around and looking head to toe at each patient. Talk about how often to calculate these rates and you can improve your data collection. For all they're found. You need to know the name of the patient. If this a new or an existing pressure ulcer, I want to look at the number of different pressure ulcers the person has and where they're located in the age of the deepest pressure ulcer. in terms of prevalence and incidence. You're going to count each patient with the pressure ulcer, 
not the number of pressure ulcers. To know the number of patients on your unit or facility. And it's easier if you have a computerized system. The point to do when calculating these rates is actually get a list of all the patients on the unit. To calculate these rates quarterly, there are seasonal variations. In other words, say you have a really bad flu season and a lot of people with chronic illness develop the flu and are hospitalized. People are going to be very high risk and might have a much higher chance rate of pressure ulcers than they think. So you need to do them at about the same time, the first month in March, the first month in December, the first month in September, and so on, so that you're able to compare the season year to year and look for variations, and then you can decide what could be in this. And for this, we need to have very good training. This means establishing inner rater reliability. If I'm going to look at a patient and I see a stage three pressure ulcer on the sacrum, you in and see a stage three pressure ulcer on the sacrum. So there needs to be some training of staff that are doing the data collection to ensure everyone is on the same page. It's very helpful if two people make the unit rounds together. First of all, you can talk about any wounds that you're unsure of. And consensus. Second, you have someone to help you if you need to turn the patient, and one can be a recording while the other person's doing the assessment. Every person on the unit has to have a head to toe skin assessment, low pressure ulcers, and it's taking socks off and looking at the heel. The biggest issues with that is when you have people that are missing from the unit. Oftentimes, we'll make the rounds early. We have to make sure the staff knows when we're coming so that they don't have people up a chair that we can't look at their bodies. And we have to come back and touch the other people later on in the day. So it might not be a one-time around deal. People may be off the unit for something. or might be something going on that you can't see every single patient at one round. the highest stage of pressure ulcer that the person has only counts once. So it's by, not by number of wounds. You might have 10 patients that have a pressure ulcer. Four patients might have multiple wounds, but I'm going to count them as one patient pressure ulcer and by the highest stage. If I find someone has a pressure ulcer, I'm going back and review chart. So that pressure ulcer was documented when the patient arrived. If it was, then it was prevalence. If not, it's already acquired or incident. Prevalence is the total number of patients you find on the unit with a pressure ulcer. To the number of patients on the unit, and that'll give you a percent. We have 10 patients that we found a pressure ulcer on. We're going to have 100 patients on that unit. So we divide 10 by 100 and multiply it by 100, which gives a prevalence rate of 10%. If, then, is the number of people that developed a pressure ulcer after they were admitted, admitted. they had nothing documented. First, in documentation immediately upon admission, divided by the number of patients in the unit. So facility acquired or hospital acquired. So of those 10 people we found, 
did not have any documentation on admission. We divide four by the 100 patients in the unit, multiply it by 100, and have an incidence or facility acquired rate of 4%. That 4% of your patients that are admitted to pressure ulcer after they can see you. Now, so might want to look at the total number of pressure ulcers that you have. And so this is going to impact your staffing level. Ten patients with pressure ulcers, and three of them have multiple wounds in various locations. It's going to take a lot longer to provide dressings and provide care for the very high risk patients than one that might have a stage two pressure ulcer in their heel where we're only going to be doing foot boots and assessment. Really look at that rate of hospital acquired pressure ulcers and see if it's telling us something about the staffing. Do we have a lot of new staff? Do we have people on vacation? So that we did this march, our rate was much higher than it was a year ago. What is there something different in our staff? I decide if we're counting only the rate of stage two for ulcers and above. Actually, that's how most prevalence and incidence studies are done. We document how many one, two, three, four, et cetera, that we have. They're only going to count in our prevalence and incidence state two and above. The reason for this is because stage one is very difficult to see, especially on darkly pigmented skin. You might be seeing that there's a lot fewer stage ones than there really is. It's that sometimes it's very difficult to decide if what you're seeing is a stage one pressure ulcer right now or if it's something else. The important thing with prevalence and incidence is know how your facility does it so that you're consistent time to time. It's so important when you want to compare your rates facility. If you're counting one and they are, are. Yours can look very different in read they might not be. So we compare like facilities, measuring them the same way. That's one of the advantages of the Hillram data. They're very specific on how it's all collected at each facility. Talk about what you do. When we rates are, how do we know we're actually following up and doing the care? So we have processes. We look at our of skin assessment. Are we doing it when we should, as often as we should. We want to look at our risk assessment performance, and we whether we've actually done the planning based on each of the risk factors identified. Go up further, was this care actually performed? Is it on paper, but unless it's been documented that it was done, it doesn't count. Cement should be done within 24 hours of admission. It's very difficult to the facility that when I go back and read the medical records, I can find no documentation that an assessment was done. This would be true even if there were no pressures or other wounds found. It needs to be documented that it was done and no issues were found. It's when I read it and I find the skin is dry, 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 suddenly they have a stage three wound on the shift and have to question whether it was being done or whether it was just being copied. So we have of records and we pull 10 records from past month randomly. We then at the nurse's notes and the medical notes from the first 24 hours. 
this should be initial nursing assessment, admission note, and subsequent nursing progress notes. Well aware in many of the computerized charting systems, some of the skin information is on very different screens. So you have to know where all this information is located. Implementation of skin in the first 24 hours. Where the lesions noted, it, but nothing was observed. And so, what is the assessment? All options should be mentioned. Temperature, color, nature, and what skin was intact. Often, the other skin was intact, it was warm and dry. That tells us how the trigger was. It doesn't tell us if there were changes in color. And we know if it was done in one location or did they actually do it head to toe. Let's we'll look at, at if people have any documentation and how that exam was. The SISC assessment. Was assessment which is the Braden scale, done admission. It's very interesting when I see a, pres, a risk assessment score, say, of 18 on the Braden scale, which means they're low risk. At the Braden scale, the, the higher the score, the lower the risk. And it goes along that way and got a 12. Usually means is that someone's just been copying again. No one's really been doing it. Because when you go back and look at what else has been documented about the patient, they have mobility issues. They do have some incontinence, yet that wasn't reflected in the assessment score. It's so important to note here that one that has had a previous pressure ulcer or current pressure ulcer is high risk regardless of the score. So how many had the score completed? And better that how many had it completed accurately? With little kit is a little checklist here of issues. Was the patient currently deemed at risk and was assessed at regular intervals? I want you to go on further and look at the actual scale items and that if care planning was actually done for each of these. To know the accuracy of that risk assessment. And what really happens is that nurses make the patient better than they really are. A patient with neuropathy, a patient with a head injury, a patient heavily medicated or that is a stroke. Do perfect sensory perception. Get nine that we've given good sensory perception. Is it be reevaluated when there's a change in the medical condition? It's now see that the person's a 12. And the teens, so they went from low risk to high risk. And I found that really it was during the time that they were 18, they suffered a significant event. Heavy pain medication or sedative it should have changed at that point. It means the person that now rated the 12 actually independently went in and reassessed their risk. At their care planning performance along with this risk. Look and say, did the care planning match the risk that was identified? No risk was found in the area. There shouldn't be care provided for it.
even if the person can't up and walk, their activity is actually a four. They walk frequently. That does are walking. What would be for them to walk outside the room? They walk around the room. What is your goal for this person? And are they actually doing it? When one prevalent in incident study, we found a young woman who was 21 years old. She was in good health. She had a car accident and had a broken leg. Her for several days because it was a very serious accident and they were worried about potential head injuries. When we did the prevalence and incidence study, she actually had a stage two pressure ulcer on her sacrum. Talk with some head and crutches? Absolutely. Was she? No. And the reason she wasn't was because her fiance was killed in the accident and she was very depressed. She curled up in bed and pretty much stayed in one position. So that she could do something didn't mean she was doing it. Even though we would have thought of her as low risk, that means we didn't need to look at care planning and actually measure whether she was doing it or not. We have an assessment tool for the sure also care plan. In other words, do something about impaired mobility. Did we get nutrition? Having a dietary consult doesn't mean that the dietitian actually came up and did it. It's been a problem. Maybe the phone system wasn't working. Maybe they didn't get the message. So was it followed through on? Have a bed, a specialty bed, like a bed. It's the responsibility to know that bed's working. It's not the manufacturer's representative's responsibility. Gone into patients' rooms that had traumatic brain injuries. They could not communicate. They were still uh, in a coma. In case, I found the bed telling me there was a sensor malfunction. So I had, and one sack of the low air loss bed part actually deflated. And I said something to the nurse. And her response was, oh, oh, the manufacturer rep will be here tomorrow and he'll take care of it. It was his job. It was hers. And if anything happened with that patient during that time, which is really possible, then would be liable for that injury. So another room and actually found someone had tripped over the cord and had noticed the bed was plugged. That patient was on the metal bed frame. Excusable. And is poor nursing care. So those are the things you need to look at. And our parents who are up in a wheelchair are going to be wheelchair bound, especially in nursing homes. We make sure that physical therapy is matched with the patient and the chair pad. Having a chair pad in your chair or the wrong size wheelchair can actually lead to the development of a pressure ulcer. A posture problem that results from the wrong wheelchair that leads to the development of a pressure ulcer. So we need to know these things are being done. We need to look at the pain. Is the patient in pain? If the patient complains of pain, we really want to make sure that they get their pain medication about 15 minutes we change their dressing. A drainage can be very painful. Flip side. I'm really upset when I go into a patient's room and communicate. They're contract it. And I roll them over and they moan. And I say, have you pain medication? Maybe we should do that before we put it on this wound. And I'm told, oh, they always do that. And believe it's happened more than I'd like to think. That pain, whether they can communicate or not, not to be treating it. So look at the pain. And if the pain level changes, gets worse, it's fine that infection is present in the wound. It's certain for 
pressure for risk to be done every time a new patient is admitted. And it can be done accurately, and care planning needs to be based on that. Any units, risk needs to be assessed daily, or any time there's a significant change in the condition. And they look at those care plans. A to bring to risk to assessment. Having the care actually performed will reduce the incidence of pressure ulcers and really improve the quality of your patient care. So you need to think about people that have care plan issues, such as people with feeding tubes or respiratory issues that need head of their bed to elevate at more than 30 degrees. And trying to remove pressure, and we roll the patient side to side, right at the head of the bed, we want it more than 30 degrees. The reason is because it puts all the weight on your bones and in a small area. So you're actually significantly increasing the pressure in areas we don't want it to. In the middle of our feeding tube or person with respiratory issues, we're putting on their butt. They're likely to experience shear forces as they're sliding down because the head of the bed so elevated. It's with people that are in pain, so they don't want to move. Both dehydration, they're at higher risk. We need to think about things like, like giving people a sip of water every time we go in the room, making sure we've addressed their pain, or if they're heavily sedated, we're making sure we turn them. What do we do for these people? These things are looking at small shifts in body weight. We have a two-hour turning schedule. But a day, that's the gold third. It might be one and a half to three hours, depending on the patient's tolerance for pressure and the type of support service they're on. I want any of you to go into your bed tonight, your side, you put a pillow behind you, and not move for two hours. You won't do it. People that can't move themselves, that's all what we're doing to them. All unscheduled shifts, put a little bit, put the head down a little bit, pull out a little bit. People want to move off a back rub. Often get them to roll over and let you rub their back. You can get a blow in. Pain's favorite position is. All of you have one when you go to bed. And if I try to put you in another position and you're really uncomfortable, anyhow, you're going to get yourself right back into the position that makes you the happiest. And we can put people onto their stomach. It can be 30 degrees off their stomach. We tend to get that we can roll them completely over. And it's for some people that's the most comfortable. We had one lawsuit where it was currently documented that the men refused to turn. We refused, refused. And he sir, into the hospital. And what scam? One. He said, hurt. All that time, people would come in and say, we're going to turn you. And he'd say, no, say, okay, and leave. They explained to him that they're asking him to turn to prevent a pressure ulcer. That it may have hurt, but I would have done it. I did not know. It is if the patient refuses to move, it's your responsibility to a different plan of care to move that pressure around. On a, a special bed, is it getting them better pain management? Is it out from them why they're not moving? But you got to change your plan and now reevaluate a change in the plan. It's nothing the patient refused. So what are we going to do with it? Important for us to track 
how the changes are occurring over time. Are we getting better or aren't we? Is it getting worse? Prevalence, because we're getting sicker people in with pressure ulcers, or are they developing them after they come to us? Can you look at these changes in terms of changes in practice? Staff turnover. Are we starting another initiative? We're now looking at falls. We're not thinking about pressure ulcers. What are you that we're improving anymore? Or what did we do right that we are improving? I mean that the leadership of the hospital knows how we're doing. Doing worse is it that we need more resources? If we're doing better, then staff gets kudos. Everyone on the unit staff should know your your prevalence and incidence rates. And post it where staff can see them. It's something to measure how they're doing too. They need to understand how they're doing and where they can make improvements. And change the culture so that the development of a facility acquired pressure ulcer becomes a learning opportunity. We see it as very negative. Very punitive. But this pressure also really have been avoided. Was it something we did? Or really have had a suit where a family alleged the staff left the, left the patient on a bedpan for eight hours? With documentation in the chart, it's really difficult to prove if that happened or didn't. In detail what happened to a stage three or four pressure ulcer. System failure or with such an acuity level. We know that people that are hemodynamically unstable, these are the patients in ICU, are very likely to develop a pressure ulcer. When you think about the fact that we're having trouble keeping their blood oxygen levels up, it's notable that the skin isn't getting what it needs. These are the people that are going to develop a pressure ulcer that the patient didn't come in with anything, but they changed, they got worse. We sent the surgery, they had an eight hour cardiac surgery. They got back and we noticed that the next day they had a stage three pressure ulcer. Was it something we did or was it something that happened because they were on a, a support or a, a hard operating room table? So what happened with this patient? What tracking of it? And what were we doing to mitigate any risk during the time we had the patient? One technique is using a root cause analysis. This is a teaching opportunity. Did we use best practices? Did we need it to do every step of the way? Our analysis is basically going backwards. And from the time the person developed the pressure ulcer, backwards to see what we're doing. How high was their risk? What ones did we do and did we document that we did them? The patient medically. The issue was homesick or called in sick or what happened? We had a lot of float people that didn't know the patients. What were the issues that were going on? The entry has an example how to do a root cause analysis, and this is the, the first sheet. Is there how your patient, when were they born, gender, admission date, their diagnosis and secondary diagnosis? Because especially with a lot of our older people, they come in with quite a thing. Know that the person developed a pressure ulcer, and did the family know right away? Pressure ulcer discovered in what stage it was, was it? And now back through and look at what our care planning was for this patient prior to that. Let's look assessment to adequately evaluate risk. Did the medically, and something happened in there? 
were the precipitating factors that could have led to this pressure ulcer? Maybe your staff did everything right, and they need to be aware of that. Too often, both the staff and the family and the patient hear ulcer as a failure of care. We all people, they have heart failure, believe us without seeing anything. Yet some of our terminal patients they keep a pressure ulcer before death, which is skin failure. So we be aware of the reasons that this person developed a pressure ulcer. To prevalence in incidents or facility acquired, and how you calculate these rates, and then you look at your practice. We need to look at our culture and see the development of a pressure ulcer as a learning opportunity, a for improvement in what we're doing. For being such good listeners, and please refer any questions you have to UI specialists and some resources that might be useful to you. Thank you for attending.